Welcome back to Volunteer Management Standards, Good Practices, and Practical Solutions. Today we're going to be focusing on Segment 3 of 4. Recruitment and Orientation. What are the ways in which we can ensure we've got the right people in our organization and that once we have them, we keep them? So a couple of things that I'd like to share with you. The first is the importance of mapping out your needs. We already covered an aspect of that uh, in the previous segment, but I'm gonna spend a little bit more time here really helping us understand um, what does it mean to map out my needs? This means conducting some kind of organizational review. And the best way I, I you know, a, a really great form of flattery is to check out what other clubs are doing and how are they structured. So you can go to, if you're a, a speed skating club, for instance, you might want to look at what other local speed skating clubs are doing or stretch beyond your borders. Go check out what the clubs in Toronto are doing. Better yet, ask yourself, who's the top performing clubs when we meet up at competitions and go check out how they are organized. Often, in my experience, sport people are incredibly generous. They will spend time with you on the phone and share information that they've come to learn. So it's a really great practice to pause long enough and in the assessment of your, need, your needs, figure out how are we structured? What's the organizational structure of the organization? And are we structured as optimally as we need to be to be a thriving uh, sport club in the 21st century? The other thing I would have you consider as part of mapping out our needs, some of the most critical volunteers are those who sign up to be directors of the organization. So a really great practice is to do a skills matrix for your board. And what I mean by that is identify the board members that you currently have on your board. Ask them to list the competencies that they have. So for instance, if I'm a lawyer, I would put that down as a skill that I have. So decision making, uh, accountant, uh, 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 if I'm an accountant, so financial management, uh, if I'm a public relations professional, then I have experience and skills related to communications, crisis management, promotions. If I'm a fundraiser, then I have fundraising skills. What you ideally want to avoid is having all technical people on your board or all communications people on your board or a board full of lawyers. One is typically enough, with respect to my friends in the room who are lawyers. Um, so what I want to encourage you to do is have that competency matrix available to you. I, well, there's lots of samples that you can draw from. Figure out the competencies that you have, and then ensure that you're avoiding the duplication of skills. And, and when I say duplication of skills, it, that also extends below the, the line to your staff if you have them. So in the old days when we typically had uh, no staff and we had operational people doing the work and then we had board of directors, we tended to attract people who were passionate about the sport of football or the sport of swimming. And these people tended to be more passionate about the technical side of the sport. And so the same people who were busy delivering against what the club is supposed to be doing are also the same people who are making decisions at the board level. So if you are too heavy on the technical side, you're missing a, an amazing window to ensure that you have um, diversity in your decision making uh, skills. I would suggest that you hire, uh, that you strike a hiring or recruiting committee. And so those are the people that are out there that are going to be reviewing. So make make sure that you've got you know a committee, and ideally you have uh, different genders on the on the committee as well as you're sensitive to the backgrounds of the people and the skills. Ideally, there's someone with an HR experience that's working on your recruiting hiring committee. I already mentioned the importance of, of flattery, and so the best form of flattery is to borrow templates of others. Sportlaw.ca has tons of different resources that you can use as does the Sport Council, the Ottawa Sport Council. So go, go and do a little bit of research to borrow some of the templates and then customize them to your needs. We spoke about in the last segment the importance of volunteer descriptions and ensuring that they are updated annually. Here's what typically happens. We post a job, we invite people to, 
to um, to join the organization. We give them some form of description, but it hasn't been updated for years. And what people have often said to me is, I'm doing work that I didn't really sign up for, or the stuff that I'm doing really isn't captured in my job description. So making sure that they're updated annually will, will ensure that you've got the right, um, you've got the right job uh, description articulation. That's a really critical aspect of accountability. A little bit now deeper in, ter in terms of conducting quality interviews. Spend the time required to ask the powerful questions. It's not just about what people know. Are, is there going to be a good fit? And that's where you want to get under a little bit, you know, in terms of why are you volunteering here? Beyond the likely answer of, well, my kid's here and I want to spend some time contributing to the organization that's giving back to my kid. What is it that you believe you can contribute to better and further the mission of the organization? What was the hardest, uh, most difficult volunteer management experience that you've had and can you share with us why that is? Tell us more about your personal values and how you see them being lived here or expressed at the club. So those are examples of what I would call powerful questions that gets beyond the technical skills that this person can bring in support of the organization. Another really important aspect is to check references. It's an established practice right now and you are at risk if you're not checking the references, especially if the volunteer position requires proximity to vulnerable populations. For those um, positions that require it, I would uh, encourage that you have what I call a feedback session. So have a meet and greet, have some of your volunteers come in and you know have them meet the other board members or staff if that's applicable in a casual kind of coffee chat session. Get a sense of the fit with the people and, uh, and get feedback and incorporate that into your decision making. What does it mean to recruit wisely? So a little bit more on that. Ensure you recruit volunteers that not only have the skills required, but have the knowledge required. So can I do physically what's asked of me? Do I have the decision-making knowledge to be able to do the work that's asked of me? Do I have the time? And this is where some people sign up for something and in the job description it says two hours a week when it actually is five and people start to feel taken advantage of and disgruntled. So really ensure that you clearly articulate what the time commitment is. Or you get the Uber volunteer who's a board of director, a coach, a manager, and also plays the sport. You're gonna to wanna to ask yourself, is that person overly extended? And then what happens when we are dealing and discussing budget items, and then that same volunteer is also a manager or coach with a rep team? So you're going to want to be thinking about the time commitment that is reasonable for a person to donate to, uh, to your club. Um, and what is their main motivation? So really getting underneath, why am I volunteering? If you can do that, then you're likely to get a better match between what it is that they're hoping to contribute and what's required in the assignment. I talked about publishing job uh, descriptions earlier and that's a really strong uh, way of doing that. So you can do that on your website. Uh, you can pick up the phone and call people that you trust and say, do you know anybody that has these skills and time requirement um, as well as passion to contribute? And you can put that in your community newspaper as well. There's billboards at local shopping centers. Lots of really creative ways for you to get volunteers to help further the mission of the organization. Be really clear though about the accountability, right? So when you bring in someone, let them know what their decision-making authority is and who they are responsible to reporting to. Spoke about vulnerable populations and the need, the requirement to have police record check. Um, beyond that though, if you're asking people to do a lot of driving, you're gonna want to ensure that they haven't been convicted of you know, a DUI or other uh, dangerous driving kind of offenses. That's just a smart thing for you to do. And you know, beyond conducting reference checks, which we spoke to, uh, coordinate, an, an, coordinate an interview to ensure fit. Now you're not gonna be able to interview everyone potentially, but you're going to want to ensure 
that the volunteers that you are bringing on meet a certain litmus test, a standard um, that will make you proud to have them volunteer in your club. And again, recruiting wisely means it works both ways. It's not about ensuring that it's not about simply ensuring that you know you you have done a good job of articulating what this job entails. You want to ensure that that volunteer also understands what that job entails. How do you how do you retain the great ones? That's a, a frequent question. You want to avoid the revolving door phenomena phenomena that can set in. Once hired, you want to support your new volunteer throughout the entry process. You know, and remember, if it's a newer volunteer, especially the younger ones that have to volunteer now to get their, their credit at, in high school, what am I doing to surround these young people or this volunteer so they have an optimal volunteer experience? And why does that matter? Because, you know, we, we want to ensure that once we've done the hard work of bringing them into our door, they have such a great experience, they want to keep volunteering. So we really want to think of ways to do that. So maybe assign a buddy system, right? For the younger ones especially, you want to ensure that you're surrounding them with, you know, adults who, who are in a position of, of, of being able to care and mentor that younger person, for instance. So for, for example, for myself, you know, as a senior, as a head coach, I've often been matched with a younger female who's come in and, and been an assistant coach or a co-coach with me and the, the experience is mutually rewarding. So think about surrounding your, your new volunteer with the support they need. Set specific milestones. So really, you know, in the early days of volunteering, especially with the younger ones, let them know what you're looking for and then reward them with a job well done. It can be something as simple as an acknowledgement, right? Or something a little bit more uh, enticing like chocolate uh, to to recognize their their uh, their contribution conduct an orientation process this is really critical so what does that mean well as i said earlier you can you can do a buddy system to mentor the new person um, you can uh, walk them through the philosophy of the club talk to them about the mission of the club when it was first established what it really hopes to contribute so that they have a deeper understanding beyond their role what the purpose of the organization is and, and how grateful you are that, that they're uh, contributing their time. Some volunteers need training. So if training is required in-house, make sure you set that up before you set them off their way. Sometimes training opportunities are on the external side. So for instance, you know, if you're grooming a new chairperson, you may want to have them take um, how to chair great meetings. You can do lots online. There's lots of little YouTube videos that they can take. Sometimes it requires uh, money to take a workshop or a webinar. So really encouraging you to ensure that your volunteers have the training, the knowledge they need to be uh, feeling really good about their contribution. Sometimes, and I really love this approach, it's a change of scenery is required. If I've been a director for beyond two terms, chances are I, I might be better, um, it's better for the organization and better for myself if I move into a different level of contribution. And that might see me coaching again, or maybe I'm managing a team, or maybe I'm going to take on a, a strategy. You know, if, if part of my, our strategy is to create a bricks and mortar home for our club, then I might be able to, with my skills, for instance, donate some time uh, on a committee work. So I would really encourage you to redeploy your volunteers in a different way. It's refreshing for them and you don't lose the great people that have spent some time getting to know the club. Evaluate performance. Really make sure that you are evaluating the quality of their performance. Feedback is key. And I wouldn't suggest just once a year, although once a year formally is really healthy. But throughout, you know, let people know what they're doing really well. Also let them know where there's room for improvement. It's what we do for our athletes and coaches, so really critical to import that good practice beyond the field of play into the executive office and boardroom. I'm going to speak more in a different segment on, on saying thank you, but let me just cement it here. Really important to acknowledge what people are doing well. And sometimes the smallest things, like a handwritten card, is all that that person needs to continue feeling valued, and so they're going to continue to uh, donate their time. 
And then finally, you know, a really important uh, tool that you can have is to develop a succession plan. It doesn't have to be complicated, but you need to know how long your board, your how long the board, board terms are. I'm an advocate of terms. And after two terms, if, if you have it in your bylaws that people aren't able to run after two terms, they have to have a, a stepping away period. Know that, you know, you don't want everybody stepping away at the same time. So coordinating that is an aspect of succession planning. So too is for the volunteer. Ideally, these people are involved in going out to get the new recruits. So they're involved in shaping the, the work of the new people uh, that'll be coming in to take their place. A little bit on board orientation. So I would suggest sharing your bylaws and other key governing documents so that your board, um, as well as your other key volunteers who might need some something on decision making, uh, they're gonna benefit from that. Make sure that your board, especially your directors, have access to previous minutes, your strategic plan if you have one, and your budget. Often I'm encouraging people now to have um, access on website that's a be you know a behind the scenes kind of portal that the board can access the, these governing statements uh, whenever they want. Important as well for boards to have a buddy, especially for the new recruits, someone they can pick up the phone and speak to uh, if they have specific questions. At the first board meeting, have your directors speak to why they volunteer and what their specific skill set is. That's going to help to elevate the dialogue and help the new person feel like they're fitting in. Uh, your chair could, could start by speaking about the purpose of the board and the overall philosophy, how we make decisions, why we do what we do, you know, getting back to the mission, vision, and values of the organization and the difference we want to make. And the other really important thing around board orientation in particular is to ensure that the new director understands and complies with her fiduciary responsibility. She signs the Code of Ethics, the Conflict of Interest uh, Protocol, as well as any confidentiality policies. You do that and you're far more likely to keep the good people that you spent so much time trying to recruit. So that concludes segment three of volunteer management standards, good practices and practical solutions.